Welcome to today's webinar, Secure Boot in Embedded Systems, the Foundation of Device Security. We're excited to explore the essentials of Secure Boot and its role in protecting embedded systems from unauthorized access and tampering. Whether you're an experienced engineer or new to the field, this session will provide some best practices to help you enhance the security of your devices. But before we begin, let's go over some quick housekeeping items to ensure a smooth experience today. We will be having a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, so please submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the Q&A button on your control panel. Should you encounter any technical issues or need assistance, just send a message through the chat and our webinar admin team are here and ready to help you. So who is FIDUS? We were founded in 2001 and we've grown into a close to 200 person all North American electronic system development and design services company. We serve all industries and markets with three locations in North America, two Canada and one Silicon Valley. We've been working with embedded systems and FPGA since 2002, and it'd be safe to say that 80% of our projects have included FPGA content. We're most proud of our 95% customer return rate, a real testament to the quality and efficiency of our work in improving our customers' time to market. We have a very strong uh, partner ecosystem. We're a gold partner with Altera um, and have many years of experience with other chip manufacturers like Lattice and NXP to name a few. Most recently, we were announced partner of the year by AMD. In our first decade, FIDUS did a ton of varied AMD Xilinx related to work. And in 2011, they asked us to become their first ever Premier Design Services member in North America. And to this date, we've been collaborating on opportunities, training together on the latest technology such as Versal and their latest Embedded Plus architectural series, all with the end goal of helping our customers get their solutions to market as quickly and smoothly as possible. We also happen to boast the largest team of AMD certified engineers and professionals here in North America. Now, as a full service as electronic systems design firm, our engineers and professionals cover a multitude of service disciplines, including FPGA design, embedded software, hardware, signal and power integrity, ASIC RDL design and verification. We help our customers by supplying some of these expert skill sets directly or by managing the complete project from start to finish. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dawson Thoreau, an experienced embedded software designer who has implemented secure boot in embedded Linux systems, specializing in BSP and low-level application development. Dawson has worked extensively with, school, with tools like Petalinux and Yocto. His expertise spans both low-level kernel drivers and high-level applications, making his insights into secure boot particularly valuable for today's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dawson. Over to you, Dawson. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, everyone. I am Dawson Teru, an embedded software designer here at FIDA Systems. This webinar will explore the principles and implementation of Secure Boot in embedded systems, highlighting its pivotal role as the software root of trust. Throughout the presentation, we will cover security in embedded systems, including the risks imposed by physical access to hardware, the role that the root of trust plays in overall context of security, an introduction to RSA and AES, the algorithms used to authenticate and encrypt components in Secure Boot. We will then cover the methods used to securely store keys used for RSA and AES for Secure Boot. Then we bring it all together by outlining the steps required to implement Secure Boot in manufacturing, build, and device boot process. And then finally, we demonstrate the importance, the important secure boot functions by acting as a malicious third party on systems with different levels of secure boot implementations. In a world with bad actors, embedded systems are vulnerable targets since hardware is physically accessible. Some important goals of security in embedded systems include preventing the device from running software that is not created by the original equipment manufacturer, to ensure that software loaded on the device has not been modified by a third party since creation, and to protect intellectual property and customer data located on the device. In some cases, protecting customer data is required by law, for example, through GDPR in the EU and HIPAA in the US. 
But how does this all get done? By implementing a secure boot process that employs authentication to ensure that software was created by the original equipment manufacturer and encryption to ensure that customer data is encrypted at rest. Let's walk through the boot process of a device running embedded Linux with secure boot enabled. When the device is powered on, secure boot is executed to perform authentication and integrity checks on the boot firmware. Since secure boot is the first secure component executed by the system, it is known as the root of trust. Through strategic authentication of future boot components, the root of trust can be extended past secure boot. For example, the second stage bootloader loaded by secure boot and executed can authenticate and decrypt the Linux kernel. Then when the Linux kernel is started, it can provide authentication and integrity checks through kernel components such as dmcrypt and dmverity. So when a pivot root happens, the root of trust can be then extended to Linux user space. Without secure boot enabled, the system root of trust does not exist. Although Linux can be vulnerable to exploits in user space, the device can be even more vulnerable through exploits performed in the boot process. Boot process vulnerabilities can give a third party access to the entire system by modifying the boot firmware or injecting code to undermine system integrity and disable or bypass crucial security features. How does secure boot establish the root of trust? Through a mechanism called RSA. RSA is an algorithm that can perform authentication and integrity checks on data through a mechanism called digital signatures. But what is authentication and integrity? Well, in the context of secure boot, authentication is a guarantee that the software booted during the secure boot process was generated by a specific entity. So say the original equipment manufacturer. Integrity is a guarantee that since its creation, the software has not been modified. So for example, say I created a bootloader for a system that uses RSA. Well, RSA could prove that I was really the one who created the software and no one has modified it since its creation. How does RSA provide this authentication and integrity check? Well, through digital signatures. Digital signatures are unique fingerprints generated by providing the data to authenticate and the special key to the RSA algorithm. One important note about RSA in the context of secure boot is its usage of asymmetric keys. Asymmetric keys means that a different key is used to create the digital signature than is used to authenticate it. Keys are generated as private and public key pairs. The private key and the data is given to the RSA algorithm to generate the digital signature. Like the name suggests, private keys should never be shared in order to avoid impersonation. The public key is then used to authenticate that digital signature and prove that its accompanying private key was used to create it. In secure boot, when an RSA key pair is generated, the private key is usually located on a build or packaging server to create a digital signature of the boot firmware. The public key is then given to the device so that it can be utilized in the secure boot process to authenticate the digital signature created by the private key. If the boot firmware contains secrets or intellectual property, secure boot can leverage the AES algorithm to encrypt the sensitive data located in the boot firmware. Encryption is the process of scrambling data, in this case using the AES algorithm, so that it can no longer be read without the knowledge of a secret component. The secret component in this case is a symmetric key used to encrypt and decrypt the data. Unlike RSA, AES leverages symmetric keys to increase the speed of the algorithm on large amounts of data. Asymmetric key means that AES uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt the data. Since only one key is used for both the encryption and decryption process, if a third party gains access to this secret key, it is trivial for them to decrypt the secret data. It is for this reason that the majority of secure boot implementations enables secure storage mechanisms for AES and RSA keys used in secure boot. Storing keys used for secure boot in a safe manner is a key detail to ensure a secure root of trust. Without secure storage for keys, authentication and encryption performed by secure boot would be pointless. Let's explore the methods used by popular manufacturers to store RSA and AES keys in secure boot systems. Before exploring the general strategy used to store public keys for secure boot, let's brainstorm what kind of access an adversary may want to the public keys to be able to exploit the system. First, let's remember that RSA uses asymmetric keys. The device, when validating the signature, 
only needs to know the public key, so there's no reason to store the private key on the device. Since the public key is not a secret, there's also no reason to encrypt it. An adversary would likely want to change the public key to one of their own. This way, they can generate their own public and private key pair, generate a signature for their personal boot firmware, and then program the device with the boot firmware and their public key so that secure boot executes without a hitch. It appears as though we may have just stumbled upon our main, re main requirement for public key storage. Public keys should be unchangeable after they are programmed to avoid them being changed by a bad actor. As a countermeasure, manufacturers such as AMD, ST, and NXP use one-time programmable e-fuses to store public keys. Like fuses in electrical circuits, once these one-time programmable e-fuses have been programmed, they can no longer be reprogrammed, making the secure boot RSA public key unchangeable. These public key e-fuses are typically programmed during manufacturing so that you can trust the keys programmed in the fuses. Some of you may be wondering what happens if there's a data breach or I accidentally delete my RSA private key and I no longer have, I can no longer create firmware for the public key on the device. Well, manufacturers typically mitigate this issue by including many one-time programmable e-fuses to store RSA public keys. In the case of public keys being leaked as part of a data breach, it is also important to be able to tell the system that certain public keys programmed should no longer be considered valid. This process is called key revocation. In addition to one-time programmable e-fuses to store public keys, a second set of e-fuses are used to indicate that keys are revoked and should no longer be considered valid. Device manufacturers implement a different number of public key e-fuses. In AMD Zinc Ultra Scale Plus and PSOC, devices have two one-time programmable e-fuses for public keys. For IMX8, there are four OTP e-fuses, and for STM32MP, there are eight OTP e-fuses. For symmetric AES keys, the main vulnerability is unauthorized access to the key. Any entity that gains access to the key will have the capability to decrypt the boot firmware and possibly gain access to sensitive data. It is for this reason that obfuscation or encryption is the most important factor when storing symmetric encryption keys. On devices that implement secure boot, there's typically a mechanism that, when provided with an encryption key, will encrypt it at, to be stored at rest, only to be retrieved by secure boot later. For example, in this diagram, the encryption key is provided to the embedded system and probed into the secure storage mechanism, which encrypts the key at rest with a device-specific uh, encryption key. Then, when secure, boot when secure Boot executes, the key will be retrieved from the Secure Boot component, which decrypts the AES key and provides it back to Secure Boot, secure boot for decryption purposes. In addition to the secure method for storing keys, some platforms such as MPSOC allow less secure uh, AES to storage key mechanisms. These mechanisms are typically used in less mission critical applications or possibly for development purposes to test the encryption secure boot workflow. Unlike RSA, where platforms use similar methods for storing RSA keys, AES key storage can differ from platform to platform. MPSOC, the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus devices, offer three levels of security. Black keys, which are the most secure, use the PUF as a secure storage mechanism. The PUF, or physically unclonable function, uses variations in the silicon to act as a key encryption key. The, encrypt the encrypted AES key can then be stored in non-volatile memory. The PUF is then only accessible to the cryptographic engine to perform decryption using that encrypted key. Gray keys, which are the second most secure kind of key, are technically only obfuscated. They, are encrypt, they encrypt the AES secure boot key using a family key. The family key is not unique per device, but is instead unique per device family. This means that all devices that are part of the same family will use the same key to encrypt the secure boot AES key. Finally, there are red keys, which are the least secure method of storing the secure boot AES keys. They are the plain text version of the key. They're typically stored in BB RAM or in eFuse, so they are immutable. Red keys are typically used during the development process to test the secure boot encryption mechanism. For STM32MP, they use a device called the BSEC. The BSEC, when provided with an AES key, derives unique information for that key. 
and programs it to one-time programmable eFuses. Then Secure Boot will provide bootloader information and the BSEC will combine this bootloader information along with its unique derived information to derive an AES key used to decrypt the boot firmware. Since the BSEC stores the unique information in one-time programmable eFuses, they cannot be the, e, the AES key cannot be changed after uh, it has been programmed. For IMX8, the device uses the Cryptographic Acceleration and Assurance Module, or CAM. Like the PUF and MPSOC, this module encrypts the key with a device unique key to be used for secure boot. Prior to deciding on an IMX8 based processor, it is important to note that the device must include a CAM module to be capable of decryption during the secure boot process. With the knowledge of the mechanisms implemented by Secure Boot, RSA and AES, as well as the methods used to securely store secrets used by Secure Boot, we can now go over where keys are generated and where they are used in the manufacturing, firmware packaging, and device boot process. Prior to device manufacturing, typically all keys that will be used throughout the life cycle of the device are generated. This includes the symmetric AES key, which is generated and given to the build server, as well as programmed into the device secure AES key storage mechanism, as well as the asymmetric RSA key pair, where the private key is given to the build server and the public key is programmed into the device one-time programmable eFuses. When it's time to generate the boot firmware, the build server will build the boot firmware and then encrypt it using AES encryption and the symmetric key stored on the server. This encrypted boot firmware will then be signed using RSA and the public key. This in turn generates the signed and encrypted boot firmware, which can be programmed onto the device in persistent memory. When the device is powered on, Secure Boot will start executing and read the signed and encrypted boot firmware from persistent memory. It will then perform an authentication check using RSA and the public key stored in one-time programmable eFuses. If the authentication fails, the boot process is aborted. For devices that support multi-boot, such as MPSOC, it is also possible to attempt to boot the next multi-boot offset. This is an attempt to successfully boot the system when the first image is invalid. If the authentication of the firmware using RSA is successful, then the encrypted boot firmware can be decrypted using AES and the symmetric key stored in the secure key storage mechanism. This will generate the plain text version of the boot firmware and secure boot will hand off execution to the boot firmware. Finally, let's demonstrate the importance of secure boot by generating three images. The first will be generated using Secure Boot with encryption and authentication. The second will only include authenticated Secure Boot. Finally, there will be a non-secure boot image. Inside the boot images, we will include a secret and we will modify the boot firmware to show the authentication and the integrity checks of the boot process. Let's go over the three boot firmware images generated for this demonstration. These three boot firmware images were generated using the bootgen utility for the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC device. The first boot.bin generated is an encrypted and signed boot.bin image that utilizes secure boot. The second is a signed only secure boot image, meaning that there's no encryption. And the last one is an unsecure boot up in that does not employ any secure boot uh, implementation. In addition to the regular firmware included inside the boot, these boot up ins like the first stage bootloader and the uh, U-boot executable, I also included a file, a secret file that contains proprietary information. This is a secret file dot text. In this example, secret file text is included in all three of these boot.bin uh, firmware images. And the contents of this secret file are, is super secret data 42. Let's see if we can find this data inside of these boot firmware images. In this example, 
In this example, we're acting as a bad actor who has somehow got access to the device and was able to dump the boot firmware from non-volatile storage. So let's attempt to find the super secret data inside of the unsecure image first. The xxd command dumps the contents of binary files, including the ASCII representation, and grep searches the output of this dumped file for the string secret. In the unsecure boot up in, we're able to find the plain text version of our super secret data, meaning that anybody who has dumped the firmware now has access to our proprietary information. Let's try and do the same on the encrypted boot firmware. As you can see, nothing is output when we look for the string secret in the encrypted boot firmware. If we go to the same offset inside the encrypted boot firmware, that is usually contains the proprietary information in the unsecured boot firmware, we can see that there is only encrypted data in its spot, meaning that we cannot read the original plain text secret data from the file. The only way to revert this encrypted data back to the original proprietary information is by using AES and the symmetric key only known to secure boot on the device as well as the build server. This demonstrates the importance of encryption for encrypting or obfuscating proprietary information located inside the boot firmware. Now let's take a look at why authentication and integrity checks are so important for the system implemented through RSA and secure boot. Here I have a system booted using an unsecure version uh, of the boot firmware, so no RSA encryption or RSA authentication check. When the system begins booting, the first thing it prints is the Xilinx Zinc MP first stage bootloader. This is printed by the first stage bootloader itself, contained in the boot up in. In the booted system, let's attempt to modify this string printed by the first stage bootloader by changing the data contained inside of the boot up in. So first, let's log into the system. and navigate to the boot directory. Pedalinux automatically mounts the uh, boot firmware location to the slash boot directory. And in this case, boot.bin is the boot firmware uh, booted by the boot process. So I have put together a script that will allow me to modify the boot.bin at a given offset with a value of my choosing. So let's find the offset of the string that prints zinc mp for stage bootloader. In this case, we can see zinc mp for stage bootloader, which is that same string printed at the beginning of the boot process, is located offset 123d0. So I can use my bash script to modify the boot up in with the value Dawson was here in this location. Now, if I instead search for my name instead of zinc mp we can see that dawson was here first stage bootloader is now the contents at that offset now let's reset the system and see how this affected the boot process as expected dawson was here is now printed as a part of the first stage bootloader this means that we modified the data contained in the first stage bootloader directly and the system still booted as expected. This is because no secure boot authentication is enabled in this boot firmware. Now let's log in and attempt to do the same thing with the authentication enabled secure boot image. So I have my authentic authentication enabled secure boot image located here. So let's change the original boot up in to be the signed boot up in. Again, if we look inside the boot up in for the first stage bootloader string, we will see that it's changed back to its original value. Let's modify it again to be my hacked value. <laughs> 
Now, if I reprint the contents of the uh, boot.bin, we will see that it's modified again to be my value. As we can see here. Now, let's reset the system and see how this has affected the boot process. I will click the power on reset button of the device. And as you can see, nothing appears in the terminal. This is because the firmware that is attempted to be booted is secured, meaning that secure boot will first perform an RSA authentication check on the first stage bootloader. And in this process, we'll detect that I have made a change to the bootloader without updating the digital signature. Secure boot then halts the boot process since it has detected an unauthorized change. This essentially blocks anybody from changing the boot firmware without having access to that private key only accessible on the build server, meaning that the system will then only run firmware generated by uh, a known good entity. Although secure boot is a key component to system security, it is not the only component. In future webinars, we will cover other important elements of security in embedded systems, including extending the root of trust past secure boot using trusted platform modules or TPMs to hold secrets used later in the boot process, as well as secure firmware upgrade. With that, I would like to thank you all for your time, and I'm going to hand the presentation back off to Alicia.